Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are, Joseph and I, going to take a look at a little fairy tale that I think almost everyone can remember as an early experience of teaching values and morality and what is the right thing to do, especially around good, hard work. And the name of this story is The Three Little Pigs. So here is the story, and we're going to use uh, the oldest version of it that we could find, uh, because oftentimes the stories get reworked and reworked. A a lot of embellishment is either removed or added, and we tend to believe that the older version is, is sort of the real deal in its original raw form. So here we go. The Three Little Pigs, an English tale. Once upon a time, there was an old sow who had three little pigs, and as she had not enough for them to eat, she said they had better go out into the world and seek their fortunes. Now the eldest pig went first, and as he trotted along the road, he met a man carrying a bundle of straw. So he said very politely, if, if you please, sir, could you give me that straw to build me a house? And the man, seeing what good manners the little pig had, gave him the straw, and the little pig set to work and built a beautiful house with it. Now when it was finished, a wolf happened to pass that way, and he saw the house, and he smelt the pig inside. So he knocked at the door and said, Little pig, little pig, let me in, let me in. But the little pig saw the wolf's big paws through the keyhole. So he answered back, No, 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 by the hair of my chinny-chin-chin. Then the wolf showed his teeth and said, Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. So he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in. Then he ate up the little piggy and went on his way. Now the next piggy, when he started, met a man carrying a bundle of furs. And being very polite, he said to him, If you please, sir, could you give me that furs or sticks to build me a house? And the man, seeing what good manners the little pig had, gave him the furs, and the little pig set to work and built himself a beautiful house. Now it so happened that when the house was finished, the wolf passed that way, and he saw the house, and he smelled the pig inside. So he knocked at the door and said, Little pig, little pig! Let me in, let me in. But the little pig peeped through the keyhole and saw the wolf's great ears, so he answered back, No, 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 by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Then the wolf showed his teeth and said, Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. So he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in. Then he ate up the little piggy and went on his way. Now the third little piggy, when he started, met a man carrying a load of bricks, and being very polite, he said, If you please, sir, could you give me those bricks to build me a house? And the man, seeing that he had been well brought up, gave him the bricks, and the little pig set to work and built himself a beautiful house. And once again it happened that when it was finished, the wolf chanced to come that way, and he saw the house and he smelt the pig inside. So he knocked at the door and said, Little pig, little pig, let me in, let me in. But the little pig peeped through the keyhole and saw the wolf's great eyes, so he answered, No, 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 by the hair of my chinny-chin-chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house in, says the wolf, showing his teeth. 
Well, he huffed and he puffed. He puffed and he huffed. And he huffed, huffed, and he puffed, puffed. But he could not blow the house down. At last, he was so out of breath that he couldn't huff and he couldn't puff anymore. So he thought a bit, and then he said, Little pig, I know where there is ever such a nice field of turnips. Do you, said the little piggy, and why, where might that be? I'll show you, says the wolf, if you will be ready. At six o'clock tomorrow morning, I will call round for you, and we can go together to Farmer Smith's field and get turnips for dinner. Thank you kindly, says the little piggy. I will be ready at six o'clock sharp. But you see, the little pig was not one to be taken in with chaff. So he got up at five, trotted off to Farmer Smith's field, rooted up the turnips, and was home eating them for breakfast when the wolf clattered at the door and cried, Little pig, little pig, aren't you ready? Ready, says the little piggy. Why, what a sluggard you are. I've been to the field and come back again, and I'm having a nice pot full of turnips for breakfast. Then the wolf grew red with rage, but he was determined to eat little piggy, so he said as if he didn't care, I'm glad you like them, but I know something better than turnips. Indeed, says the little piggy, and what may that be? A nice apple tree down in Merry Gardens with the juiciest, sweetest apples on it. So if you will be ready at five o'clock tomorrow morning, I will come round for you and we can get the apples together. Thank you kindly, says little piggy. I will sure and be ready at five o'clock sharp. Now the next morning, he bustled up ever so early, and it wasn't four o'clock when he started to get the apples. But you see, the wolf had been taken in once and wasn't going to be taken in again. So he also started at four o'clock. And the little pig had just got his basket half full of apples when he saw the wolf coming down the road, licking his lips. Hello, says the wolf, here already? You are an early bird. Are the apples nice? Very nice, says the little piggy. I'll throw you down one to try. And he threw it so far away that when the wolf had gone to pick it up, the little pig was able to jump down with his basket and run home. Well, the wolf was fair angry, but he went next day to the little piggy's house and called through the door as mild as milk. Little pig, little pig, you're so clever. I should like to give you a fairing. So if you will come with me to the fair this afternoon, you shall have one. Thank you kindly, says the little piggy. What time shall we start? Three o'clock sharp, says the wolf, so be sure to be ready. I'll be ready before three, snickered the little piggy. And he was. He started early in the morning and went to the fair, rode in a swing, and enjoyed himself ever so much, and bought himself a butter churn as a fairing, and trotted away toward home before three o'clock. But just as he got to the top of the hill, what should he see but the wolf coming in, all panting and red with rage? Well, There was no place to hide but in the butter churn, so he crept into it and was just pulling down the cover when the churn started to roll down the hill. Bumpity bump bump. Of course, Piggy inside began to squeal, and when the wolf heard the noise and saw the butter churn rolling down on top of him, bumpity bump bump, he was so frightened that he turned tail and ran away. But he was still determined to get the little pig for his dinner. So he went the next day to his house and told the little pig how sorry he was not to have been able to keep his promise of going to the fair because of an awful, dreadful, terrible thing that had rushed at him, making a fearsome noise. Dear me, says little piggy, that must have been me. I hid inside the butter churn when I saw you coming and it started to roll. I am sorry I frightened you but this was too much. The wolf danced about with rage and swore he would come down the chimney and eat up the little pig for his supper. But while he was climbing onto the roof, the little pig made up a blazing fire, put on a big pot full of water to boil. Then, just as the wolf was coming down the chimney, the little piggy off with the lid and plump in fell the wolf into the scalding water. 
So the little piggy put on the cover again, boiled the wolf up, and ate him for supper. So one one of the things that strikes me about this tale is it, it does not shy away from gore, does it? Uh, two little pigs get eaten, and then we have the satisfying ending of the wolf dying, boiled and being to death. gobbled up. That's, right. That's a wonderful <laughs> part of the older fairy tales that the um, that instinctive intensity remains yes. in the older fairy tales. Yes, exactly. And I, I think you know, especially with the advent of cartoons and so on. Oh, we we don't want kids to be, uh, you know, scared of of violence is really bad. But uh, I think about a lot of cartoons that I watched at the movie theater as a kid, and it was very satisfying uh, when you know Wiley e. Coyote and Bugs Bugs Bunny was pretty violent. Uh, there were a lot, uh, and it was very satisfying for. Honestly, every kid that I ever knew, including myself. Well, I, I think there's the, uh, I can't remember the British essayist who wrote this. Um, that, uh, we shouldn't be afraid to read our kids' fairy tales. Children already know that dragons are real. <laughs> fairy tales teach them what to do about it. Uh, oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. So little kids it's, have uh, dreams. They're pretending, Daddy, Daddy, I'm going to shoot you, and you have to pretend that you're dead. And, that's uh, right. Yes. So w- what are they enacting out? Are these primal archetypal themes? They want it played Ex- out exactly. in ways that are safe. But these themes of birth mm-hmm. and death and gobbling up and, you know, and you can mm-hmm. see grandma running after the kid. I'm going to gobble you all up. And the kid's squealing, you know. Um, right. All the kind of yes. play, and, mythic play. Right. And we do that with kids. Of, I'm going to gobble you up. Here I come. I'm going to the first toe. That's right. Here's the, the second toe. laughing and squealing. The, uh, how else do we make friends with and, and metabolize and integrate are these kinds of primal emotions, like you said about the monster under the bed, uh, the dragon, the, you know, bang, bang, you're dead. Oh! The ghost. You know, fall down yeah. theatrically. The ghost. That, that by playing with them, by symbolizing these experiences, and uh, if we clean it up too much, what we're doing is making an exile out of uh, all of these sort of primal feelings of aggression, uh, anger, defiance, fear. It's like, oh, it's too hot to handle. No, no, don't, don't read that story. Uh, you know, don't let these uh, cartoons be uh, too violent. Uh, whereas the encounter is what makes it safe. Right, and the wisdom of fairy tales quite frankly, is how do we contain these core instinctive powers in image, in story, in myth? Yes. Because the story right. gives us a place to put it uh, that wolves you know, are the ones that are mm-hmm. really going after the pigs. So that's a way to visualize and imagine a wolf-like energy inside of the psyche. Yeah. And the wily pig, the shrewd, pig that's able to, uh, you know, figure out how to handle the wolves of the world is a kind of yes. lesson um, that we yeah. can also need to teach kids. <laughs> so, you, you know, uh, I, I want to go back to the beginning. Sure. Uh, we're, is that, okay? is that a good? Yeah, let's do it. Let's treat the very it, let's beginning. analyze it. It's a very good place to start. Yes. Um, the kid, these pigs are kicked out. Um, mom kicks them out. There's not enough for them to eat. So off you go, out into the world. Bye-bye. Good luck. <laughs> Seek your fortune. And many a tale starts with that of our little 
kid hero or heroine tossed out into the big wide world. And the separation from the mother and the mother complex Mm -hmm. as well as the family. And of course, in the, in the natural world, little pigs have to fend for their own when the mother pig weans them that the, the sow doesn't produce Mm -hmm. milk all forever and ever. At a certain point, the milk dries up and the, uh, Baby pigs have to be able to root around and find food and eat solid food. So they have been weaned. Um, the, the teat is dried up. Uh, mm-hmm. Natural instinct. You've got to go start rooting around for what you need. Yeah. Um, the, the great mother cannot keep providing. You know, it's... Uh... I won't get the facts of this quite right, but the great mother and the pig is a great symbol of the great mother. Uh, uh, Demeter, or Ceres, from which we get the word cereal, um, her, her totem animal was the pig. And a pig can go from being a piglet to market weight of over 200 pounds in something like six months. So th- there is something about pigs and how fast they grow, how easily they put on weight, uh, that, that is also sort of remarkable in, in this. And the great mother sow says, it's time for your encounter with reality, little piglets. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one way or another, I think that's a developmental task for all of us. Yes. Uh, and we hopefully we learn it bit by bit rather than uh, in such a drastic way as is symbolized in the tale, you know, that we, we have all these little encounters of uh, the tussle with uh, somebody maybe at nursery school or kindergarten or um, the kid who hoodwinks you mm-hmm. uh, in school. I was hoodwinked by, by a kid who wanted to be first in line and promised me if I would let, he gave me some story, if I would let him be first in line to get into school, uh, he let me have a turn the next day. Well, of course he didn't. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there, there's a little story about what is reality and it's not fair and that's not right, but you promised. But these pigs are, it's all or nothing for them. Right. It's not little by little. It's, you have to figure out how to survive. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is that the three little pigs um, already have this instinct on how to build houses, which impresses me no end. That the straw house, which really <laughs> isn't quite strong enough, is by accounts in the fairy tale a really beautiful house. Somehow these pigs are carpenters and house builders, and they instinctively know. <laughs> how to shelter themselves in some way. Yeah. Well, of course, pigs are very smart. I mean, out there uh, in the external world, pigs are incredibly smart animals. So, of course, they bring to this house-building task their, their native intelligence. And we won't go into how they manage all this um, with the hooves. Uh, what's straw? You know, straw is basically grass, is it not? Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, it's it, it's lightweight. Uh, it comes from the from the earth. Uh, it's very flexible. You know, it would be easy to work with, to fashion, to you know, to knot up or bind together or whatever. Uh, you could get the job done pretty quickly. And isn't it interesting that all it takes uh, is to ask for it? And these, uh, this is the know, attribute. The little pig says, give me, would you give, give it to me? And the man says, oh, what nice manners you have. Right. And this is the introduction of the masculine to the psyche. The pigs have known the mother. And then when they mm-hmm. go out into the world, they encounter the masculine. And they have to have yeah. some kind of relationship. To the masculine to at least try to build the first home. So there's something here about uh, asking and receiving. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that that's all the pig has to do is, is ask. As if behind it there is a kind of promise that, that the world will be responsive to your need. Uh, if you know what you want and you can ask for it uh, with, with respect. Mm -hmm. Uh, you you can have what you want, and the endeavor is uh, to to build a house, to build a dwelling, which is an effort of ego mm -hmm. uh, that we have to think about this and where do we build it and how do we kind of anchor it to the ground or do we build a foundation, but. All of this takes ego. It's not instinctive. And where we live is kind of, uh, it symbolizes who we are. Yeah, we, we all know this whenever we go into somebody's house of what colors are on the walls, what kind of art, what kind of furniture, uh, that we want our house to look like, like the me who who lives there. And this pig, good with straw. Big mistake. I'm thinking about um, that comparison between the straw, the furs or twigs, and the bricks. And as often we will take a fairy tale and imagine that it's the dream of someone in order to take a symbolic attitude. So these three attempts in the psyche to, to build a home, uh, a platform, perhaps uh, an attitude that one can stand on and mm -hmm. build a life on. So the straw attitude yep. is something that's ephemeral, although people did thatch their roofs and with straw mostly, and that worked for a good bit of time. Um, straw walls are another matter of uh, more difficulty, undoubtedly. But we can imagine that the first attitude of the young person is not strong enough to withstand the vicissitudes of life. And when we think back to the attitudes that maybe we had when we were, oh, I don't know, 15, 16 years old, we'd take a stance about one thing or another, and that when that was challenged, maybe often <laughs> they would kind of collapse and we couldn't really defend mm. our position about the world <laughs> or our position about why we have to have something or we have to do something. It's got to be this way, and it's, or it's life or death. Mm -hmm. These mm -hmm. straw houses, sometimes you have that term, a straw man, um, when people oh, right. talk about arguments. And uh, it's the thing that can't really withstand very much at all. Mm -hmm. It's more representative that this is a this is a house like product, but it really won't function as a buttress against mm -hmm. the vicissitudes or challenges of life. Right. Yeah. You you know, um I had sort of this memory from you know a thousand years ago of you know that this was a story about laziness of, oh, what a lazy little pig to build a house of straw. But really, looking at this today, again, it's, and thinking about what you've just said, it's just, he doesn't know any better. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't know any better. He has to build a house. He sees a guy with straw. Uh, it's a little impulsive, a little unreflective, but also just very, very young. And then, of course, there's part of the fun of the fairy tale is, the, the, you know, the wolf and the little pig, little pig, let me in, let me in. Aha! Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Of, you, you know, you can really hear that sort of lip smacking uh, tone here of the aggression, the thing that wants to come in. And, and, and it's fun for the child listening to the story or the child in every single one of us. And he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house and he ate up the little piggy. Ha ha ha. 
<laughs> so, so if I come back to, let's say, being 14, 15, 16 years old, we build a house of straw attitudes. And then somebody mm -hmm. who's a little more powerful in their mind, a little more determined, starts pressing on us that, no, you shouldn't believe that. You should believe this. Let me in. Let me be in charge. I'm the one who knows what mm. to do. And we might, as teenagers, for instance, say, no, listen, I'm my, I'm my own person. Then we find that our stance is not strong enough, and then we wind up getting mm -hmm. swallowed by something else, someone else's attitude, someone else's mm. agenda, or perhaps being swallowed mm. by our instincts, that mm. we, we'd like to keep the wolf away from the door, but we're young, just mm. as you were saying, and we don't really know how to stand against the wolfishness inside of ourselves. And so to be swallowed by the wolf, which is interesting because in alchemy, mm. there's an image of the wolf swallowing or the lion swallowing the sun. So when yeah. the wolf or the lion swallows, it means that the instincts have gobbled up the ego. And then mm -hmm. the personality is acting in these wolf-like, lion-like ways and has lost some ground about being an individual mm -hmm. and being an ego. Uh, I was uh, just thinking about what's a wolf, and uh, in alchemy, I think it's just primal instinct, yes, primal exactly. hunger. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the wolf is a favorite character in fairy tales, you know, as we know, uh, especially in Little Red Riding Hood. It's unconstrained, raw appetite. And we still talk about, you know, wolfing your food yes. uh, or, uh, you know, the, um, the wolf in sheep's clothing. It's the predator. Uh, he wants to devour. And, and that, is, uh, that is in us as well. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. The little pig who builds his house of straw um, you know, pays for his non-reflective, non-strategic uh, outlook with, with a creature that is equally non-reflective. It's mm -hmm. not that the wolf even sees the pig, he can smell him. Right. And that's our, you know, that is the sensory uh, f faculty that we have that there's a connection between nose to brain. It's just immediate. Uh, <clears throat> smell pig, eat pig. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. So, our, yeah. Our wolf has power, but he's, he's, not especially brainy. But then we move on to the second pig, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, sees a man carrying furs. And I did not, F-U-R-Z-E, I didn't look it up, but it's, it's sticks or twigs. And does the same thing. He just says, would you please just give me the, give it to me to build a house. So mm -hmm. once again, the world, the external world is accommodating the masculine principle, says, yes, I will help you in your ego-building endeavor that is symbolized by a house, and here's the material that you have requested. And then what happens, Joseph? It's very sad. Once again, <laughs> life challenges the, uh, the ego. <laughs> A uh, wolf smells the little piglet in there. At first, it is also an interesting thing. At first, there's a demand, let me in, let me in. Now, I'm not sure what would have happened if the pig had let him in. But this is also an interesting moment that often happens in nightmares, <laughs> where oh. there'll be a nightmare figure that it represents some psychic quality that we find really frightening and we don't know how to have a relationship with, so we will often run away mm. or buttress against it. So 
Often in fairy tales, and, and I had a dream very much like this once, where there was a, a pounding on the door, and uh, it, was, it was a dark and stormy night. And I come down this mm-hmm. long, extraordinary stairway to the front door, and I open it, and there's this howling monster um, standing yeah. in the doorway. But I had opened the door. <laughs> let me in, let me yeah. in. And it was a real initiation. I, I had this revelation that the uh, creature was howling out of pain, and I began to weep out of compassion for the howling thing. Mm-hmm. And it transformed into this kind of glorious angelic image. Mm. Oh. So sometimes opening the door mm. could lead to something unprecedented and a possible relationship. But here, mm. this this state of the ego can't imagine any conscious relationship with its own wolfishness. That, that just isn't going mm-hmm. to happen. And as often happens, if we keep these unconscious contents away or our instincts away, then they will start threatening to overtake us and gobble us up. And so we have another iteration. Either either you open that door and you meet me, or I'm going to swallow you. And there's endless examples of people getting swallowed by their instincts. It's a great image of, uh, in a way, the archetypal unconscious. Yes. And it, it's our job as we grow up, uh, little by little, frustration by frustration, uh, defeat by defeat. But the little ones, like my being hoodwinked by an older kid, uh, of growing ego strength and uh, meeting those wolf like. Uh, characteristics of other people or just the world in in general. And uh, we have to build a barrier. Mm -hmm. And so our little pigs, are that's what they're trying to do, is keep the wolf part of psyche out uh, so that there is uh, a defense and it doesn't work. The archetypal wolf energy comes in uh, not through the door, but just by blowing the whole thing over. That I can imagine this whole thing like a a tornado, just kablooey. It's over, and we see that again and again with with kids um, who have a a meltdown. The toddler that has a meltdown, the the little kid that comes home from school because he scraped his knee and is just in distress. The distress has taken over, uh, that that barrier has gone down. But I'm thinking just literally about sticks. At least sticks are sturdier than straw. Mm -hmm. Uh, They have the potential uh, to become a tree if they had been able to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. A wooden house is a good thing. Mm-hmm. But here, too, the material is not sturdy enough. It's not developed enough. They're, they're, it's basically kindling, I guess, but not strong enough. Right. And there is a sense of progression, as you were saying. If we think of the fairy tale as a dream happening in a single person's psyche, the straw house, the, the inadequate clarity of the mm-hmm. ego doesn't work, so it suffers being gobbled up by the instincts. Yeah. But it comes back out, and it's learned something by being swallowed. Mm-hmm. It said, you know, I need something stronger. I need something tougher if I'm going to hold these instincts at bay. I also want to say that this isn't just a child's um, issue. I, I think about New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions oh. are built out <laughs> of straw. Generally speaking, oh. you know, like I'm going to go to Weight Watchers, you know, starting on January 2nd and I'm going to lose 50 pounds. Mm-hmm. You know, and then we have this straw house that looks like, you know, counting points for Weight Watchers. And then all of a sudden somebody says, come on over for dinner, you know, and that's all it takes, you know, and you are going to eat yeah. a half a gallon of ice cream. 
Um, and we're like, no, I won't by the hair of my chinny chin chin. And the next thing we know, the wolf yeah. has swallowed us and we've eaten a half a gallon of ice cream and we're watching, you know, reruns of Friends and we're like hating ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I've had that experience. But <laughs> oh, I, I know you were just, um, exactly. it was a hypothetical situation hypothetical. altogether. But the it's wolf very, blew your house very down, Very funny man. because it's so true. Yeah. The, and that's it, that raw appetite of the wolf can smell it. He smells it. And that's, it's very analogous to your uh, situation of, I smell that delicious dinner, and I would love to have seconds and then dessert. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, we cannot stand against some of those appetites. Not until something yeah, the else next needs day to we happen. Go, oh my God, what yeah. happened? Oh yes, exactly. I oh, ate eight thousand right. calories Some... last night. But that's such a good point. We can't stand against it with just a good intention mm -hmm. or a New Year's resolution. Something else needs to be there to stand against it. And as an aside. Um, in terms of success with things, things like diet, but also quitting smoking and other things, that sure. the longer people stay with the attempt, the more likely it is that they will eventually succeed. Mm. So there is something mm -hmm. about, I go in the first diet, ugh, it's like straw. And then a year later, I go on the diet again, and I'm a little more successful. It's, it's, it's furs and twigs mm -hmm. that I built the house out of. but still. There I am, eating a gallon of ice cream a night. Yeah. And then the, the third or whatever mythic third time, something in the ego is strengthened even through each failure. Mm hmm Yes. I, I think that's really perfect. And if we think of this like a dream, you know, then every pig is the same pig or the image of building ego strength. Mm -hmm. And I know there are studies about cigarette um, cessation, smoking cessation, that, that persistence pays off. Exactly. Uh, just like you're saying of first time straw, second time twigs, but third time bricks. bricks. And, and the story changes a little bit because um, the pig says, uh, if you please, sir, could you give me those bricks to build me a house? And the man, seeing that he had been well brought up, gives him the bricks. See, in other ah. things, he has good manners, uh -huh. he's polite. But the third um, iteration, it has something to do with this developmental strength that's inferred in the fairy tale, that there's something mm. sturdy in how you were brought up. Mm -hmm. So you, you get the bricks. That just being polite or just yeah. being nice isn't quite enough muscle. Yeah. Uh, so there's something about that stance that's implied of intention and, a, as you said, a sturdiness. I, I also am thinking about bricks mm -hmm. uh, symbolically as a great combination of the natural substance of mud or clay mm -hmm. comes from the earth like straw, like twigs, but you have to render the, the clay. Mm -hmm. You have to shape it and you have to bake it. And that that's the alchemical process of calcinatio, uh, the hardening the fire, uh, the ego effort that takes it and renders it and cooks it uh, into something hard. I like that, that the two other iterations of suffering through getting, getting eaten up has somehow given the ego, just as you said, this capacity to hold heat, to hold fire, ah. and to put it to good use as you said, making bricks, mm -hmm. that the ego really has a structure. And for the ego to have a really nice muscular structure, 
means that we've really we don't have half baked ideas that we actually have <laughs> <laughs> right we have full baked <laughs> ideas which yes. suggest yeah. i've really mm-hmm. actually thought about this half baked ideas mm-hmm. are like um, furs and straw they don't really stand up to pressure or scrutiny but when we're full baked it's like i know what i know and it actually makes sense and i can stand mm-hmm. in what i know and what i've experienced stand in the choices that i'm making consciously so as you said mm-hmm. this little pig has baked bricks and they serve <laughs> they serve him very well yeah i i like what you said <laughs> i'm underlining it of they can hold the heat mhm and we have to be able to hold the heat of our emotions. Uh, not get carried away with impulsivity or uh, reactivity of any kind, but I'm going to hold the heat. I'm going to make these bricks. I'm going to fire them. Uh, there's a process, a methodology. And, and the fortitude to see this through. Oh, there's a beginning and a middle and an end. And that's what our pig does. Mm-hmm. So that should be the end of the story. Of He builds his brick house. The wolf can't blow it in. But it's not. Right. So part the, two part is two, forthcoming. <laughs> which is to really think about it. It becomes, to me, much more interesting because the ability to contain the wolf instinct brings forward a much more sophisticated relationship with the wolf that the pig and the wolf Mm. now are having a dialogue which doesn't happen the Mm. first few times. The third pig is like, I can talk, I can negotiate, (laughs) <laughs> um, he's he's getting some wisdom from the wolf. Like I didn't realize there were turnips in the field down the road. Thank you very much, instinctive self. I'm gonna make good <laughs> use of make good use of that. So there is something about the muscular ego and the ability now, yeah, to to get something from yeah. the instincts that that the pig can really use. Yeah, it really elevates the battle from just raw power of the all the wolf has to do is huff and puff, and the structure stands or falls, the pig gets eaten or not. So now we have a battle of wits. So ego development is moving right on up the scale of the, that the wolf is going to try to trick the pig. Turnips down the road, you know. And the pig says, oh, good. And he agrees to meet the wolf. But, of course, that's his strategy. He has no intention of doing so. So this battle of wits is a great developmental stage of the first time that you have lied to somebody. The first time you've tried to outsmart somebody, of I don't have to give you a shove and push you down. I don't have to hit you. I can outsmart you. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's a much more sophisticated uh, ego level of, of battle, of contest. And this theme shows up in many fairy tales where the thing that's dangerous becomes the thing that's useful. I think about that Grimm's fairy tale of the spirit in the bottle, where the, mm. the young person opens up a bottle that he finds in the crux of a tree. This devilish, incredibly murderous thing comes out of the bottle. He tricks it to go back in, and then he cuts mm-hmm. a deal. And the, the spirit comes back out of the bottle and is able to provide important help to the hero. So here, Mm -hmm. there is this new relationship where the ego is not overwhelmed by the wolf, and the wolf is also giving good information. Oh, there's turnips over here. There's apples over there. 
There's, mm. there's stuff that the ego, that the wolf can smell out that the ego now has access to without yes. the destructive part of it. But again, being really conscious and respectful of the danger of that mm-hmm. instinctive self that the pig doesn't lose sight of who he's dealing with. Yeah. So our story keeps moving along, and uh, the the pig has access to the turnips, but then the wolf catches on. Oops, pig's getting up before me. This time I'll be the one to get up even earlier. And we, then we have the little episode uh, with the butter churn of our, our pig goes off to the fair, and of all the things to buy, he buys a butter churn. What do you make of that? And there, well, you know, I, I love, there's a whole thing about in alchemy about churning. And the, this patient process, it's almost like making bricks. You've mm-hmm. got to go and get the clay and shape it and bake it and so on. But the churning just goes around and around. It's not, it's not a linear process with, uh, it's a slow and patient uh, kind of, we would call it a circumambulation of just going around and around to render cream into butter. Uh, and we have all kinds of um, speech metaphors about churning. Uh, well, something's really churning inside. I can see it going. Uh, and I've seen, uh, probably we all have, of movie images of some woman patiently sitting in a kind of contemplative state, just churning the butter and it, uh, or, the, or the cream. And it has to be contained. So we have the image of a container. Otherwise, the liquid will spill out all over everywhere. Mm-hmm. So it's an interesting thing that this is his desired purchase from the fair is a churn. Uh, that basically um, clobbers the wolf. So he sees the wolf coming, jumps in the churn, and rolls down the hill. I'm really, I'm really um, tasking myself with imagining <laughs> uh, or psychologizing a little bit more about the um, the butter mm-hmm. churn. So one one thread that my uh, associations go to is the story begins where the great sow basically says, I have no more milk. You know, I, uh, the yeah. fruits are dry. Now it's time to be weaned. You must go and eat solid food and find it. But here, somehow the, the third pig, as it continues to grow wiser, more shrewd, more successful, mm-hmm. that he returns to the milk. Here, the ego is not going to depend upon the mother principle. Right. The ego is realizing, well, I can, I can provide that some of the comforts and the goodness of the mother principle because he was well raised, that he is able to access some of the good things that the mother has shown him. And he can learn how to take the milk and make it into something that he wants, something that's delicious and useful, and also can Mm -hmm. be stored, by the way, without souring. Right, exactly. So I I like that return to to the milkiness. Yeah, that's that's great. And here we have a real uh, defeat, in a way, for the wolf, of that the wolf says, hey, look, I'm so sorry I couldn't meet you because... uh, this thing, meaning the butter churn, an awful, dreadful, terrible thing had rushed at him, making a fearsome noise. So the instinctual part of the self, of our wolf, doesn't know what to make of this. He has no way to recognize it's a butter churn or even just a round thing rolling down the hill. Uh, this is way outside the wolf's parameters of comprehension. 
It was monstrous. Uh, so wit has won. A- and the good news about this instinctual power that the wolf has is it's not all that smart. Right. And I love that the third pig owns his own potency when he says, well, that was me. Oh, I'm so sorry that <laughs> I frightened you. So now there's this real change of energy that, or as often happens in dreams, that the dream ego receives part of what the other image held. So for instance, sometimes a dream figure will come to you in a dream and maybe it's a person who really wants to fight you and they're really aggressive. And then as (laughs) this image is interacting with the dream ego, the dream ego starts getting really aggressive and angry. So it's as Mm -hmm. if the energy that was stored in the dream image gets transferred into the ego, and it has a sense of that quality of libido. So what's really wonderful here is that all of the capacity to frighten was in the wolf, but now through the interactions, The pig now has a capacity to frighten as well. It has a bit more wolf in him. Yes. Isn't that great? This is such a great story of ego development. Absolutely. And, and And you have to appreciate the sarcasm of the pig. I was like, oh, it just started to roll and I couldn't help it. And I'm so sorry. (laughs) <laughs> a little passive-aggressive piglet. <laughs> it's really, really great. Yes. And then the wolf loses it. Right. Um, he danced about with rage, swore he'd come down the chimney, eat the little pig. And then the, the final victory of the pig says, Hey, good, wonderful, great. You want to come down the chimney? I'll put the pot on with boiling water. So that that's where you land when you come down the chimney. And it's the final flip of the wolf is, has eaten two pigs, and now the pig gets to eat the wolf. Yes, that the full measure of wolfishness is now in the pig. That he becomes the one who eats. He becomes the one who can uh-huh. be frightening. He becomes the one who is shrewd and tricky. Yes. And can... Uh, sees opportunities. So in the end, yes. I'm imagining that as the pig is eating the wolf, that this is an ego that has integrated an enormous amount of its own instinctive shadow. And this pig mm-hmm. is going to be someone to really deal with. This pig is going to run for mayor. It's going to start a factory. <laughs> it's going to become a lawyer. You know, this, guy's, this pig is going to take the yes. world by storm. Yes, it's, and it's a gloriously satisfying ending of just in that way of rubbing your hands together, yeah, gotcha, of an affirmation of the aggression that it takes to run for mayor <laughs> and, and start a factory of, yes, you can get out in the world and you can exert your will and make things happen. It's a really a wonderful tale of, uh, that is so satisfying about developing ego strength, getting out in the world, and doing the things you want to do. And the things that we fear are often the things that we need. Mm. And I think many analysts have said this. James Hillman has said this many times in his writing. You know, the thing that is absolutely the most frightening thing often is where the gold is hidden. And yeah. so, you know, we're, we're kids and we're just mm-hmm. terrified of writing. It's often because we have a destiny to be a writer. And the destiny mm-hmm. is so intense and so overwhelming that when we're young, it, it feels like it's a terrible thing that's pursuing us and we flee. So mm-hmm. the thing that we fear the thing that we are most defending against 
is often yeah. a place where, where what we need right. is absolutely stored. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm going to reiterate uh, what I said before. Not only is it important and worthwhile of facing down your wolves and building a house, but it's so satisfying. <laughs> Yes, it is. It's very satisfying. So maybe that's a uh, that's a good time for us to uh, to turn to a yes. dream. Our dream was submitted by a listener who is a thirty-year-old female. And she works as a long-term care assistant, and she is training to be a death doula. And here's her dream. I was at my childhood cottage, and there were quite a few people there, including my family and some strangers. An unknown young couple came across the lake on a tandem bicycle, and I was mystified as how they had ridden a bicycle on water. The most vivid part of the dream was when I was up on the deck of the cottage, and from up high I could see a pink piglet scooting along the bottom of the shallow lake, trying to reach the shore. I ran down to the water, jumped in, and the piglet reached out to me, which I felt deeply touched by. I pulled it out of the water, and it was shocked to see that its whole chest and belly were slit clean open down the middle. There was no blood, and suddenly I realized it was some kind of animatronic pig. I could see some of the metal parts inside. I just didn't want to believe it, and I felt so disappointed, or even betrayed for some reason maybe because I had already felt such an emotional connection while saving the piglet. I walked towards the cottage with the piglet, and the dream ended, I woke up. The dreamer adds as context, They are just now settling down after several months of big changes, moving across the country, a new job in a new field, living alone for the first time, completing my death doula apprenticeship, etc. She writes the main feelings in the dream were fear, sadness, confusion, disappointment, and insecurity. And she adds a bit more explanation. The dream also featured an ex who left with his wife near the beginning of the dream. I had a secret and extremely difficult relationship with him that is still affecting me a lot. My recent move brought me back into proximity with him, and that has brought up old patterns and deep wounds. So just uh, for context, I I just happen to know what a death doula is. So there is a, a, um, a, a field that is emerging of people who are very interested in how to create a certain context and atmosphere around people who are in the active dying process. And so people who are interested in this will often find various um, opportunities to be mentored. It, it's, it's almost like an aspect of hospice, although it's not rather official. Mm-hmm. So a death doula might literally come to the bedside, um, educate the family on what to expect if they wish to be present during the act of dying of someone. Um, They might uh, arrange music. They might arrange other things in the environment to create a quality of peace and presence. And it is fundamentally founded on the idea that the act of dying process of the individual is sacred, should not be avoided, Mm -hmm. and is something that is deeply and powerfully important 
to the yeah. person who is dying rather than simply mm -hmm. escaping as we often do in the Western world and being frightened. The death doulas, like midwives, lean in to try to hold the psyche of the person mm -hmm. who is preparing to die. Well, that's um, really helpful and lifts up for me uh, one of the themes of the dream about crossing, that a death doula helps someone cross, cross over, cross from living into dying. Right. And into the unknown of, you know, then what? Well, we don't really, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's a crossing. And in the dream, uh, we have crossings. There are people that have crossed the lake uh, on, a tandem, on a tandem bicycle. Mm -hmm. And then there is this uh, piglet that is also crossing, but this piglet is crossing uh, under the water. Uh, and we have in uh, external world waking life, uh, there is the crossing that the dreamer herself has just made of uh, moving across the country to a new job and back in proximity with her ex-boyfriend. So there's a lot of transition going on at every level. I, I really love how you highlighted the idea of the crossing because that, yeah. that is so powerful and so substantive in the streamer's life in so many different ways. I think that's just a perfect um, stance for the dream. So she's at her childhood cottage, and there's lots mm -hmm. of people there, family and strangers. So I often imagine that when people are starting the dream in, uh, in a setting like the family cottage, I'm imagining that the dream is somehow working on the family complex or working on the yes. child complex in some fashion, mm -hmm. trying to make some progress around it. And from within the context of the child complex, a mysterious unknown couple on a tandem bicycle mm -hmm. have this paranormal ability to just ride across the water. So a tandem bicycle, for those who are not familiar, you don't see them that frequently, but they are um, mm. basically two bicycles that have been, I guess, merged together. So um, two people can sit on this one structure one in the front mm -hmm. managing the handlebars and one in the back kind of just stabilized. And both of them are pedaling on the same chain. So there's four legs moving the rear wheel forward and uh, people get to have a chance to be um, close to each other and in the same kind of unified, coordinated mm -hmm. effort. Yeah, it's a great image of two, mm -hmm. of two-ness. Um, the, the bicycle built for two. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll look sweet upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. So, uh, and I'm putting that together with um, the comment in uh, explanations of her ex-boyfriend has a wife. And it says, the dream also featured the ex who left with his wife near the beginning of the dream. Right. Uh, she had a secret relationship. So it's interesting that that's not in the dream. It's in the explanation right. of the vanished twosome, the ex and his wife, and then this magical bicycle built for two uh, riding on top of the water of, of, of people coming uh, across the lake. One of the uh, things I'm picking up just from your associations around the crossing, that um, 
part of the death doula process is to be in tandem with someone as they are crossing. Uh So it's also an image that kind of works for that, that she and the person who is dying, I imagine Mm -hmm. it's perhaps sitting in the front seat, are are both working in tandem to move to Mm -hmm. to the next shore successfully. Yeah. And uh, in that way, it's a rather wonderful glimpse at a a Mm -hmm. symbolic or metaphoric way of looking at it. Yeah. So it's interesting the juxtaposition of connection and separation, that the death doula is there with or in tandem with the person who is dying. Right. And the goal is separation. Exactly. That and once the other shore is reached, the person dying is, right. is on their own there in the next journey. Right. Uh, and I think that's being played out here that there's this magical bicycle mm-hmm. that can be ridden ridden on water. Uh, and then we have this mysterious pink piglet running along the bottom of the lake. The piglet reaches out, and our dream ego feels deeply touched. Then it's she sees its chest and belly slit open but no blood, and then she realizes it's really a mechanical, it's not a living creature. I don't know if I can pronounce animatronic. Okay, I managed. There you go. Okay. Um, so, so there's the disappointment of hoping for the connection with the living thing, uh, but and, and the instinct and the passion to reach out to to save it. And, uh, of course, that can't happen because it's not a living thing. So our dream ego winds up alone Mm -hmm. and disappointed uh, by the thing that looked like it had life but does not. So she, there's something on the surface of the water which um, is visible and miraculous. And then there's something mm-hmm. mysterious under the water or deeper in the unconscious, which is also moving towards the shore, much like the bicycle. I have this fantasy that you know they're kind of keeping pace with the other, that the bicycle's kind of on top and the little piglet is right under it, <laughs> you know, on the ground. It's not in the <laughs> dream, but it's <laughs> how I uh, want to organize it. But the piglet is the thing that looks like it's at risk. They're doing fine on the bicycle. She's not worried about them drowning, yeah. for instance. But the thought that a live piglet is, is drowning, ostensibly, and uh, she's rushing in to save what she thinks is at risk to help it. And um, it, even though it might seem to be reaching out to her in need, it's actually simply a, a machine. It's kind of um, moving along. So there's something we could say. It's something mm-hmm. about um, a need for greater discrimination. How does one discriminate you know, a living thing from um, something that is not living, uh, even if they mm-hmm. somehow look the same? Um, where is her compassion rightly? Centered, and where is her compassion? Perhaps something that's more about sentimentality. Um, mm. That it's almost that something has kind of tricked her into being worried that something is suffering, which of course isn't suffering. So there's discernment is somehow being evoked here. And I, I'm going back to. Maybe the the impetus, the urge, the dedication uh, to connection, and then uh, against all odds of, I mean, of course, a pig uh, cannot run across the bottom of of a lake that's filled with water, right? And uh, and I'm putting this together with uh, being a death doula. 
But on the one hand, you connect with the person who's dying. But on the other, you let them go. Mm-hmm. But it feels like in this dream, the energy is all about connecting. Uh, and that it's important to connect with this pig. There's no other position here. And it's not real. Any more than riding a bicycle on water is real. Uh, but the the urge to connect is so powerful. And I wonder about, you know, as you often call it, the medicine in the dream. Mm -hmm. That the medicine in the dream may be the disappointment that this thing has a slit in its belly and there's no blood and it's awful and, oh, it's not even alive. Mm -hmm. And what in our dreamer's life is no longer alive that she nevertheless reaches out to and and hopes to connect with. So this could be the, the relationship, perhaps, with that fellow that she's still trying to sort out what it meant to her and how it's affecting her now that she's back mm-hmm. in the physical proximity, that the piglet in that way could be the kind of repetitive, almost mechanical way that certain memories will Mm -hmm. um, run over and over again, like a perseverating machine over and over again, but may not actually have a true life of their own, but are really just Mm -hmm. kind of movie scripts. We were just running over and over again. Mm -hmm. I think I'm I'm taken with the idea of the death doula. I have a friend who does this work, so it, it, it prioritizes in my psyche. But if I were also to think about that there is this lifeless machine that's just kind of scurrying along at the bottom of the water, which uh, evokes a lot of compassion, but there's something on the top that's miraculously in the tandem bike moving above the water, I wonder if this is a way that the psyche is trying to help her organize an attitude about the dying. For many death doulas, there there really is a clear sense that the body is a kind of machine which is running down, Mm. which is um, breaking down, and that there is a spirit, there is the consciousness inside that is vibrant and alive and on the move that is that is getting ready to leave the machine of the body and go on its own journey. So mm. I'm imagining this having worked in a hospital and, and seen people actively die, um, that to see the body go through the active dying process, it's very difficult to separate out what the body is doing and what it needs Mm. versus what consciousness may be experiencing. And so this separation in the dream of the mechanics of the form versus the life, the tandem life, on the surface of the water that is basically flying, Mm. it's it's able to float above things. Mm and that when she puts her compassion into saving the mechanics of the body that there's that she feels like she's kind of missed something that that her her um prioritization of the machine of the body might be misplaced mm. and that mm. it might have been more fruitful for her to be more curious about the the spirit on the tandem bike that is on a mm. journey across the surface of the water. Um, mm. Just a possibility. Yeah. I think in a way, uh, this dream is all about where is the life? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's not on the bottom of the lake with the mechanical piglet. Mm -hmm. 
Um, not sure about the tandem bike. My guess would be something off there that it's on the surface of the water. There is life in the work around helping someone die mm -hmm. for her. And where is the life in her uh, new life of the geographic move? Um, where's the life? And as you said before, the, the question of discernment, uh, which is always a question for all of us about all kinds of things. Yes. Mm. Yes, and as she looks from the high place in the cottage from on top, she has this broader perspective, so there's a lot of information from the skybox, as you say, Deb. Yeah. And, and having all that information, it's still a challenge to know, as you said, what's the priority among the many things that I'm able to yeah. see from the objective position. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.